Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. He was, I think he was the second pilot to fly across Bass Strait 100 times. So he, he put in a lot of hours um, over between uh, King, Flinders and um, Essendon Airport and, and, and uh, Tasmania. The voice there of Andrew Johnson, president of the Tasmanian Aviation Historical Society based in Launceston, Tasmania, and uh, describing his grandfather, Lawrence Johnson, known to everyone as Laurie Johnson, an aviation pioneer from Tasmania. You're going to hear all about that in a moment and about TARS, the Tasmanian Aviation Historical Society, T-A-H-S, and the, uh, the nascent Tasmanian Aviation Museum. Andrew's a gentleman. It was great to talk to him, and you're going to hear my conversation with him in a moment. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra, My name is Gary Hills, I am a QAM volunteer and I'm here to be your host and to introduce you to Andrew Johnson and the Tasmanian Aviation Historical Society. I will confess that uh, those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast and who actually pay attention to the bits that I say... (laughs) as opposed to our very interesting guests. I did announce in last week's episode that we would have uh, an episode today featuring Tony Johnstone. Uh, Due to a number of technical issues, which I think I've now resolved, um, that will be next week. But I spoke just yesterday, as I'm recording now, to Andrew, and the conversation was just a lovely little snapshot of a fascinating and very important part of Australia's aviation heritage, which perhaps many of us uh, on the mainland have not heard or acknowledged, and it's it's really worth hearing. So we'll be talking, you'll hear my conversation with Tony Johnstone next week. Just for now, though, here is my conversation with Andrew Johnson. Okay, so I'm talking to the president of the Tasmanian Aviation Historical Society, Andrew Johnson. G'day, Andrew. G'day, Gary. Thank you very much for joining me all the way from Launceston. I I appreciate your time. We have met once last year briefly, didn't we, when I was down there, and it was great to hear a little bit of the story of the Aviation Historical Society, TARS, T-A-H-S, and your uh, endeavours there to establish an aviation museum. And I thought, right, we need to talk and we need to put this into the podcast. So here we are. Um, I believe you were, your background is as uh, exhibition and conservation manager at the Queen Victoria Museum there in Launceston. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's that's what brought me down to Tasmania, uh, about uh, 12, 12, 13 years ago and introduced me to um, the aviation stories down here, which mm. I did know a little bit about. I'm uh, sure you but... did, and we'll come to that. There's a reason for that. <laughs> so yeah. where did you go? Where, were you, where are you born, Andrew? Uh, born in Melbourne. Uh, grew up in Victoria. Um, oh, moved from Melbourne into regional Victoria. Um studied industrial design so I've had a sort of a, a creative career and then uh, got into um, exhibition design and that was sort of a key role at the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery to, mm. uh, designing exhibitions. Well it's a fantastic museum and art gallery I, I've only had one brief visit there but it's uh, you know congratulations it's uh, it's wonderful displays you have there and exhibitions. Um, how old is that museum? Uh, that goes back to eight Seen something. It's been around for a long time. It was um, established uh, as a small art gallery, and then it, as it evolved, it's um, grown and the collection grew, and they've moved into the old uh, train and tram workshops mm. in Inveres. So it's expanded quite a bit mm. um, over time. It's a great location, isn't it? It, it? it just looks like a museum. It looks correct <laughs> in that building yeah. there. So look. Um, that's that's your background then. Tell us uh, about TARS. Tell us about the Aviation Historical Society. 
Well, Taj uh, started up in 2019, and it was um, through uh, Chris, a fella called Chris Byrne, and another another fella who um, got involved in the uh, Hangar 17, which is the um, one of the oldest buildings on the airport site at Launceston uh, Airport. Launceston Airport, yeah. And that was built in the early 1930s um, by the Hollymans. Mm. Um, and so there was some lovely history there, aviation history. Um, a distillery has taken um, over the tenancy there and uh, it's become quite established. But mm. uh, they understood and, and um, welcomed the uh, connection with aviation and so started to put together a bit of a display so that... Um, People who were uh, visitors coming in to taste their uh, whiskey could learn a little bit about uh, the history of the building, mm-hmm. and it, it sort of grew from there. We we realised that there was um, significant history there. There was significant Tasmanian aviation stories, and so a small group gathered together and and decided to form this aviation historical society, which there wasn't anything like it in the state at the time, and, and still isn't. And we we came to the realization that it, these stories weren't being told um, very well. They weren't being told at all in the major institutions like Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery and the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, in which Hobart. is incredible, so, isn't it? Because it's such a story to tell, such a diverse story. Well, it is, and there are some significant um, uh, aviation or aviators. Absolutely, like absolutely. Let's get to that. Let's get to those in a sec because when when people hear all those put together, it's it's incredible from this tiny yeah. little area. So just before we get there, though, you you set about to form the Tasmanian Aviation Museum as a part of that, didn't you? As a sort of a separate entity. Well, that was uh, that's sort of our long term plan. We um, we don't have a home really. We we meet regularly in the um, Hangar Seventeen, but. Uh, we, as a plan, we'd love to develop uh, some sort of aviation museum somewhere in the state. Mm. And and I suppose meeting where there's a distillery is not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well. it's, it's it's a difficult place to conduct um, a productive <laughs> meeting, Gary. Yeah, we, yes, it's the distractions sure. of aircraft coming and going and the and the wafts of whiskey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it's a good way to get people in anyway. What they yeah. do once they get there is perhaps another matter. Well, so we might talk about the plans for the Aviation Museum in a moment. Let's We briefly touched on history there, so let's get there because our listeners need to know if they don't already um, what, a, what a huge role Tasmanians played in the establishment of aviation in Australia. Now, give us a couple of names. You mentioned Hud, Hudson Fish. Is he from Launceston? Yes, he um, he grew up in Launceston and went to school in Launceston, mm. and um, obviously co-founded Qantas. Obviously, yeah, that's right. Um, I've actually I've just uh, finished the um, the recent um, uh, biography about Hudson Fish, which is a good read. Mm. Uh, yeah, so he was uh, he grew up in Launceston, and then he he went um, across to the mainland and up to Queensland, and um, had an enormous. Um, uh, Involvement with uh, Qantas and establishing that airline. Yeah. Uh, Harold Gatty was another one who who grew up in Launceston in Tasmania. He was a Tasmanian boy, and um, he uh, was the navigator on the first flight around the world and established um, uh, Fiji Airways. I'm pretty sure. Um, so some, and of course, then and the Holliman. And who, the Holliman family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who eventually uh, took their little airline all the way through to um, Australian National Airways, which was one of the major airlines in the 40s and 50s. Yes, ANA, the forgotten giant, someone has called it. Now, so yeah. the Hollymans, we can talk about the Holliman family, but there was a significant connection that you had prior to the Hollymans and along, you know, contemporaneous with them, wasn't there? And that was your grandfather, Lawrence. That's right. Tell so, us about Lawrence uh, Johnson, Laurie yeah. Johnson. Laurie Johnson, um, he uh, he saw the potential of um, aviation in uh, around Bass Strait um, and bought uh, or purchased the DeSouter uh, BHUEE 
1932 and started up a little commercial airline flying from Western Junction, Launceston Airport, across to Flinders Island. And that was uh, quite successful. So he was flying. He could fit two passengers in the DeSouter and uh, had the mail service. And he started in March of 1932, and the Hollymans very quickly saw the potential there because he was obviously competing with their shipping. Mm. And uh, Victor Hollyman in particular, who'd come back from the war and as an aviator, was keen to get in on this action. And so by um, October, the Hollymans had already purchased uh, De Havilland, uh, Foxmoth, and they were, they were starting to fly to Flinders Island as well. Uh, that quickly became um, a bit crowded and the uh, two uh, airlines or the two aircraft merged to form Tasmanian Aerial Services. And Laurie Johnson continued flying with them for a number of years. Uh, as uh, and, and that grew. They purchased more aircraft, the um, DH-84s and then further down the DH-86s and 89s. I think Laurie was their chief pilot at some point, wasn't he, and, and a training pilot? Yes, yeah, he was. Um, Very he innovative. Was, he was, and um, he was, I think he was the second pilot to fly across Bass Strait 100 times. So he, he put in a lot of hours um, over between uh, King, Flinders, and um, Essendon Airport and, and, and uh, Tasmania. So, so you know, you have memories of your grandfather. Well, not really. He he uh, sadly died uh, when he was only fifty four. Mm. My age at the moment, and um, uh, so I I never met him. But um, it's been uh, such a lovely experience to come down here and um, uh, discover a lot more about him and, and his aviation um, history. Mm. What what describe him to us as a person? What sort of a bloke was he, in your experience, uh, from what you know? Well, through stories through um, Laurie had two sons, Peter and David. Uh, David's my father, and uh, just through stories uh, through them, he he sounded like he was a bit of a character, um, uh, and he had a good sense of humour. Um, he must have been a fairly independent sort of fellow, um, a progressive thinker. He uh, he was he continued through um, the airline industry, and he was he started off as a, um, a training other air, uh, pilots. So mm-hmm. he must have been a fairly patient man to imagine fly, and a trustworthy person to fly with um, um, these other pioneer aviators. But um, and he was obviously quite a responsible person. He worked his way up through um, the airline, through Hollymans, and then in A and A, he held quite a um, uh, he held a management role with A and A. Um, he, I, I think, he was a very sensible person. He, as far as we know, didn't have, um, apart from one tragic uh, accident very early on, and the um, air pageant in Launceston where he crashed a, um, I think it was a gypsy moth. Uh, I think his um, record was fairly clean. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, he, he must have, um, uh, I think he was a, my, my uncle always said that he was a very much a family man, and I think that's part of the reason he um, retired from flying uh, fairly early and went more into a um, uh, management role in, in the airlines rather than continuing to fly. And if we may ask, what caused his early death, Andrew? Uh, he was a, a classic smoker. He apparently he always had a, a pipe or a cigarette in his mouth, and I, that, that eventually caught up with him. Mm. I mean, irony. It's such a dangerous you know, occupation that he, <laughs> he pioneered, yeah. and the smoking got him, the cancer got him. That's yeah. very sad to hear because uh, at that point, at, in his 50s, he must have had a lot more still to give. He... Um, he must have been, you know, as you say, sensible, um, careful, clear-minded, but also not afraid. I mean, 1932, flying across you know, the Bass Strait um, in these little aircraft like the DeSouter, that was not for the uh, the faint-hearted, was it? 
No, I, 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 I totally agree. He must have been fairly courageous. Um, the, the run from Flind, uh, Launceston to Flinders Island uh, would have been, he could, once he left Western Junction and got some up past uh, over Mount Arthur or through the pass there between Barrow and Mount Barrow and Mount Arthur, he would have got enough elevation, a few thousand feet, that he could have seen the islands, um, Cape Barron and Flinders Island, so uh, would have had a, a good line of sight, and I'm sure he didn't tackle terrible weather. Having said that, I, there are newspaper clippings of uh, requests for him to fly some uh, medical flights. He flew uh, at least one to Flinders and one to King Island where there was some um, someone very sick and flew in some pretty horrible weather to um, pick these people up and bring them back to Launceston Hospital. Mm. So, um, he, yeah, he did take on some bad weather. So that was a flight of, what, less than an hour? Uh, from Western Junction to Flinders, yes. Yeah. Uh, just a bit over an hour, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he purchased this DeSuto himself, is that right, with his with his family's money and named it Miss Flinders? Yes, that's right. I, he, he was destined to continue in the family business, which was... Um, uh, in the law business, law um, trade, um, but he he really wanted to fly, and this uh, little aircraft, uh, the DeSuta, had just been flown back from uh, England by um, Jenkins and Jeffries, two Australians who went across there, uh, wanted an adventure, so flew, uh, took the ship across to England, uh, purchased this DeSuta and then flew it back to Australia, uh, eventually found its way to Melbourne, and then and he saw the opportunity to purchase this aircraft and um, start up the um, aerial service. Now, I've seen Miss Flinders, and anyone who goes through the Launceston Airport can have that pleasure, um, mounted on a pole, beautifully restored, with great uh, information boards behind it. So I guess at that point, at this point, that is really the Aviation Museum on display to the public, isn't it? It is. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it's been such a, 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 a pleasurable a pleasurable journey um, with this aircraft to see it get come back to Launceston Airport um, where it's now being displayed. It was on display there from, uh, for about well, nearly 30 years from the 60s mm. through... Um, before the airport had some major renovations done. So um, there are a lot of Launcestonians who fondly remember this little aircraft on display downstairs. Um, they refer to it as the little blue plane. Um, so it's it, it, it uh, started in the 1930s flying out of Launceston Airport. Um, it spent a lot of time over on the mainland doing a number of different um, roles. Um, survived all those uh, different roles and was discovered in a hangar in Burke uh, and brought back to Launceston. So just it's been fantastic the way it sort of kept coming back. It's been uh, maintained and is in good condition. Um, well, it was part of one of your displays at the museum, wasn't it, the, the, the Queen Victoria? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, when I started at the Queen Victoria Museum, part of my role was to put this air, aircraft back on display. Mm. So we sus- suspended it in um, the John Lee's Gallery, which and it looked fantastic up. Um, uh, there's a mezzanine level, so you could, uh, even though it was suspended quite a fair way off the ground, you could you, you could look at it quite closely from the mezzanine. So that worked very well. Uh, and then uh, after 10 years, it was time to bring the aircraft down from that display and um, the TARS had just become established and so we were in a position to uh, take on the custodianship of that aircraft and worked closely with the Launceston Airport and managed to put it back on display. And it is a, a wonderful display and it's so heartening to see that it's, you know, 
protected from the weather. It's actually inside the terminal, so it's it's okay. You know, many of our aircraft at the Queensland Air Museum are fated to be in the open air, and uh, especially salt air is uh, is a constant issue uh, in terms of corrosion, as you could imagine for them. So for those who are interested, Miss Flinders is a Mark II De Souter, 120 horsepower De Havilland Gypsy Three, I believe. Yep. Okay, for those who are interested in such detail. And one of only three left in the world, which is... Ah, really? Um, Where are the other two? Yeah. Uh, there's one in the UK, um, and which I believe is still flying. And then there are two in Australia, one um, in Moorabbin, and uh, we, and the Miss Flinders is the third. And is the aviation bug, you know, has that bitten you too, Andrew? Is it in your family line? Are you a pilot, for example? <laughs> well, I... Um, I'm, I'm not. I've, I've, it did get the, the bug did bite me um, over the last uh, well probably two or three years, and I I started having flying lessons, but I re- regret to say that I've I've left my run too late, and uh, life uh, commitments have sort of um, uh, led me away, and I, I I don't think I can continue. But I've 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 had a taste, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, sure. Now the the the, the uh, aviation museum, given the fact that you know a location is still something to be resolved, really, um, you've you've established a travelling exhibition. Is that right? Yeah, fantastic um, idea. Tell us about that. Well, we, we realised that uh, the long term plan to develop a, an aviation museum uh, is it really is a long term plan. So to Tell these aviation, Tasmanian aviation stories and get the word out. Uh, we thought that a touring exhibition would work well, and we approached the uh, Flinders Island Ferno Museum, which is a lovely little museum on Flinders Island. Uh, it's been running for quite a long time by volunteers, and we've um, developed this touring exhibition, which started as quite a basic concept, but um, has evolved, and uh, the um, Ferno Museum have discovered lots of lovely stories um, of island flying and, and aviation. We've combined them with the stories that we had. They've all been supported with fantastic photos, uh, letters, and, and some objects. And so that um, we've managed to create a um, an exhibition uh, which has opened on Flinders Island um, and it will now, uh, that'll finish in April and then we'll come back to Launceston and we'll be on display at the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery uh, later in the year in September. And then we're touring it on to King Island and we're currently in uh, conversation with um, TMAG down in Hobart, hoping to put it on display there. So even though... Um, yeah, we haven't got a permanent base. This is a lovely way to tell the stories uh, and spread the word around Tasmania. And it's called, I think, Flying by the Seat of Their Pants. Yes, that's right. Very good. Very good. Well, it's yeah, the focus was on um, fast straight flight between 1919 and 1939. Goodness. Wow. Well, congratulations to you and the team there. I mean, you know... The Queensland Air Museum began also with a very small band of dedicated enthusiasts, uh, all volunteers, all, you know, uh, keen to get something going. And uh, next year we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. So that was 1974 wow. that the name was established, but they got underway meeting as a historical society like you in 1970. So, you know, all kinds of things are possible, Andrew, and um, we would love to think we could work with you on, uh, you know, as, as time goes by. Maybe we can share experiences and, uh, you know, help one another out. We'd, we'd love to, to connect with you if we can in any way. And uh, all the very best because, you, you know, the, the Tasmanian aviation story is surprisingly important and interesting yeah. for Australian aviation, and I, I, I just don't think very many people know about it. Yeah, thanks, Gary. We, we, it's been fantastic to um, meet you and, and continue to um, chat mm. and uh, really mm. appreciate the support. Because, um, yeah, we feel the same, that there are um, some really significant stories and um, 
we hope we can we can build on that. It's been, uh, I'm sure, um, you've had the same experience. The the more people find out about um, uh, the, the, the 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 society, the more things come out. We've had um, just recently one of the relations of Arthur Long, who was the first um, who, who flew across Bass Strait for the first time in 1919. His, uh, I think it's her, his niece who's living in Tasmania heard about us and has the compass from that um, aircraft. Oh, isn't that and incredible? Form, really? And have, have donated it to us. So um, these, these lovely objects uh, are coming out from collections um, around the state and, and we'll, we'll be able to um, put them on display and, and really uh, tell the stories. Wow, that's wonderful. So listen, mm-hmm. if you're visiting Launceston at any point, and I do recommend you do that, Launceston is a, is a, a gorgeous little place, and Tasmania, is, of course, the entire state is worth visiting. If you're a mainlander and you haven't been there, make sure you, if you go through Launceston that you uh, have a look for the uh, Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery and check out, after September this year anyway, the Flying by the Seat of Their Pants travelling exhibition. And uh, keep an eye on the website, the TAHS, Tasmanian Aviation Historical Society website, and you'll get information there. And I think you've also already begun to collect uh, some of your um, some of your collection is online there on your website, Andrew. I think is that right? Yes, we've got we've got some of it online. Yeah. And I think you're recording stories like we're doing just now. Is that right? Uh, we're trying to put some oral histories together. Yes, we mm. we have, and that'll be part of the exhibition in Launceston. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, it's been great talking to you, Andrew, and it was you know, a pleasure to meet you last year. I look forward to seeing you again sometime. All the very best with what you're doing, and uh, thanks for that little snapshot into the aviation history of Tasmania. Thanks, Gary. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Cheers. So that's our episode. So next week, Tony Johnstone... And uh, I know you're going to enjoy Tony's uh, story. I will give you this much. Tony has a very long career of very challenging um, uh, aviation experiences as a pilot. He said to me, and uh, I think this probably encapsulates Tony's story, he said to me that he saw his license, his pilot's license, when he was a young fella, his pilot's license was a license to learn. And he spent all of his life building upon that, taking on new challenges, new learning experiences, and continually continually developing his experiences as a pilot in the Royal Australian Air Force. Tony's a lovely guy also, and you're going to really enjoy hearing his story. So thank you for listening today. Don't forget the Queensland Air Museum, celebrating 50 years next year, is uh, open every day from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., except Christmas Day and Easter Friday, and we would love to meet you. Come on in and see us soon. Bye for now.